We'd like to thank our patrons, Ian Schneider, Jim Collison, Lori Schwartz, Wanda Lewis, and Amy Schindler. We could use your help. Become a patron of the North Omaha History Podcast for as little as a dollar a month. Head on over to NorthOmahaHistory.com slash podcast and click on the Patreon button. And uh, if you do that, we're going to give you a copy of the historical fiction thriller, Murder on Saddle Creek Road by Adam Fletcher Sassy. Welcome to the North Omaha History Podcast with noted author and historian Adam Fletcher Sassy. Each week, Adam takes you on a guided tour through Omaha's dynamic past. In a place as old as North Omaha, there's bound to be a lot of ghost stories. And Adam has researched stories about the ghosts of Fort Omaha, the Lady in White, Carter Lake's Burning Lady, uh, the Emanuel Deaconess Tunnels, Chapel at Forest Lawn Cemetery, the ghosts at Hummel Park, and North Omaha's missing cemeteries. Okay, Adam, tell us more. Well, Steve, I'm one who likes to look back into history and see all of the different angles on it. Lots of people like to focus on architecture, and they like to focus on famous figures, and they even like to focus on big events, and I love all of those, especially North Omaha. But when I look really deep into North Omaha and really started to research the history and find out what people had said about the area, one of the things that really came out were ghost stories. Everybody's always loved good ghost stories. When I was growing up in the Miller Park neighborhood, we had ghost stories all around us. We got to hear about what was going on right there in the park or right there at the school or right there in the neighborhood at some old spooky house. And we loved to share those stories. I was scared by them all the time, and I still am. That said, I want to tell some of the ghost stories that I've learned about as a historian looking in at North Omaha now in my adulthood. You know, one of the first stories that really comes up is about the ghosts at Fort Omaha. When I was a kid, I used to hang out with another guy who uh, his dad was faculty at the Metro Tech and they lived there on campus. And one of the in one of the old uh, military officers quarters that are there, the duplexes that are up on the hill. And this guy's name was Josh, and he would take me past the old buildings, and he would talk about all the ghosts and stuff. So I researched that, Steve, and I started to dig into it. Man, I found all kinds of stories about dead soldiers who had died on the base. There was a horrific uh, gas accident that happened with the dirigibles that used to fly at Fort Omaha. And there were sad widows that roamed around. A young girl who had lost her life when she fell down some stairs. But one of the stories that I liked the most is the story about the nicely dressed middle-aged man who's seen in different places around the campus today. Apparently, when the night is right, we can look over in the windows and see this man standing there. He's wearing a 1910s or 20s era suit with rounded collars and a nice tie on. And he looks a bit like a professor. He looks a bit like a, a traveling salesman, but we don't really know who he was. There are some people who suspect that he was actually one of the earliest teachers for the military there on base, and that in his role, uh, he was accidentally killed by some friendly fire there on campus when they were uh, practicing gunfire. He just got in the way and got shot, and his ghost still haunts the campus today. So there's stories like that all around Fort Omaha. We have other stories about the 1918 flu epidemic, uh, when soldiers were falling sick left and right, and the poor soldier who lost his life only to hold on to his memories of his love for his home in Iowa, and he would stay at the campus and roam the campus as a ghost, forever feeling the pain and torture of that uh, flu from 1918, but missing his family back on the farm. There's also the story of the soldier who went crazy, crazy at the thought that he had to get back into one of these balloons and fly in the aerial sky and do the whole uh, aerial reconnaissance thing in the balloons that they were doing in World War I. But this guy was so afraid of heights that he went crazy rather than get in the balloon again. So there's all kinds of these stories around Fort Omaha. But when we start to look across North Omaha itself, a lot of other stories started to come out. One of the earliest stories that I found was from 1874. It was the story of H.P. Stanwood. He was a sculptor and a marble cutter who lived catty corner to the Prospect Hill Cemetery at 33rd and Parker. The corner 33rd and Parker was a pretty popular place already in the 1870s. Uh, wagons had come through by the military highway uh, and they were heading west to join up to the Oregon Trail. 
But when they got to Omaha and got to that intersection, they would have seen Stanwood's um, stone cutting store. And there he made markers for the cemetery. One evening in July, Stanwood and his assistants were hanging out at the shop, working away, when all of a sudden an apparition appears above their head. They look up at her and Stanwood, see, Stanwood was a working man in, in Omaha in the 1870s. And so he would have had his house right behind his shop. And him and his assistants, he had assistants who actually slept in the additional house that was behind his house. So you can imagine it was a full lot. And when this apparition appeared, she showed up right above the beds of these two assistants who were in the second kind of building behind Stanwood's house. So the assistants run into Stanwood's and they're screaming their heads off. There's a ghost following us. Stanwood is a really serious guy. And he says, nah, that doesn't believe it. All of a sudden, this apparition appears right in front of him. She's huge and wears this flowing white dress and looks like a skeleton. You know, Steve, all of this is from the Omaha Bee. This is a real newspaper article, and all I'm doing is retelling the story. So this is a real historical ghost story. Stanwood and his assistants were chased out into the cemetery by this apparition who was chasing them the whole time. But she kept calling out to them, Where are my children? Where are my children? The bee reported that the two assistants, they were so scared to go back to sleep after this apparition left that they went and rented a hotel room in downtown Omaha. This, you know, that, and at that point, that was two miles away. So they were riding the horses way into town. Stanwood stayed in his shop. He thought it was all bunkus or some kind of weird anomaly. But then the next night, she showed up again, this time chasing Stanwood out of his house. The third time she appeared, the assistants were back in the spare room. And apparently, in their fear and terror, they knocked over a lamp when they were running out. And back then, all the lamps were made of oil. And that oil caught fire. And that little shack burnt down, and they had to fight the fire to keep it away from Stanwood's house. Long story short, they never found out who the lady in white was. But she's kind of like the story of Carter Lake's burning lady. I found this story in the 1910s newspaper about a restaurant that was opened to that it was built at the Rodden Gun Club in Carter Lake. Uh, it was on the south side of the lake, which at that point was considered part of Omaha, East Omaha, part of Nebraska. And uh, basically, this new restaurant looked over the lake. It was serving the people who lived at the Rod and Gun, Gun Club or came there for summertime to enjoy their time. And this new restaurant, everybody was excited. And the chef was busy all day long until one the first night that he went to uh, go to sleep in his room. He lived above the restaurant in a little tiny attic bedroom. And as he was falling asleep, he noticed there was a flame in his room that wouldn't blow out he kept blowing at it and it got bigger and bigger and bigger until it turned into a blue flame lady who was swirling around his room he had no idea what was going on and he was so scared that he insisted that he get a new room the next day he said i'm never sleeping in there again and, he, and the uh, rod and gun club ended up giving him another shack to live in what he didn't know is that 15 years earlier there was a high society lady who had her fancy cabin on the shores of the lake and her and her husband were very happy newlyweds when they first moved into this cabin. But one day in the first week that she had lived there, she caught fire by the stove that she was cooking on, ran in terror out of her cabin on fire, and fell to her death right on the beach, emulating herself while her husband stood by and watched. And by the time that he could put the flames out, he had lost his young bride. And she became Carter Lake's burning lady haunting the lake for at least another 30 years i found another reference of her in the 30s and then i never heard of her again until i found this story so the excitement continued all around north omaha you know a lot of people are obsessed with those tunnels steve we talked before about the florence boulevard tunnels and tunnels in downtown omaha are always a popular topic but you know one of the things that people forgot is that right there in north omaha at 34th and meredith avenue used to be a giant hospital complex for the Emanuel Deaconess Hospital. The Emanuel Deacons, Deaconesses were women who were trained to be nurses and doctors, essentially, uh, who came from all over the United States and Europe to actually do this as their act of service to God and their church, right there in North Omaha, 34th and Meredith. They ended up building a campus that had more than a dozen buildings. They had an old folks home. They had a orphan orphanage they had um, a full hospital 
Eventually, they had a drug, a drug and alcohol treatment center, all kinds of things going on right there at the Emanuel Deaconess Hospital. In the 1970s, they moved out of that complex. They built a whole brand new complex out on 72nd. It still stands there today, although it's an entirely different operation. It's still called Emanuel. But they left behind their old complex. And in the dozen years between the time that they closed and the last building was torn down right around 1989, Stories started to pile up. Stories about ghosts in the old chapel and ghosts in the old hospital and ghosts in the old folks' home. You know, a couple of the buildings are still standing from the actual hospital that was there originally. One of them being the Deaconess's original home from the 1890s and another one being the orphanage. And both of those are still standing still today on North 34th Street. Once upon a time, though, between all of these buildings that were on that campus, there were old tunnels. I actually have a picture of one of the tunnels on my blog at NorthOmahaHistory.com that people can look at. Inside of these tunnels, they were maintenance tunnels. They were built as maintenance tunnels originally. They were concrete and brick, and they were paved over, and everything was very sealed up. But they had all kinds of piping that was running through these tunnels. Well, rumor has it that when they tore the last building down in 89, they didn't actually demolish the tunnels. They didn't bother to go to the sub-sub-sub-basement where the tunnels ran. You know, the tunnels eventually became useful instead of just for maintenance. They became useful for moving patients between buildings. So if you had an elderly person who needed to be moved from the senior folks home to the uh, home for the invalids or to the hospital, you could take them through the, hospi through the hospital tunnels in the middle of the winter instead of having to bring them outside. Well, a whole new housing development was built on top of this campus in the 1990s. And what nobody told these people who were moving in and their brand new houses was that the tunnels might still be underneath them. Sometimes, I have a friend who lives in that development, and he told me that sometimes, in the middle of the night, you can hear pounding on the pipes in the tunnels that are underneath those houses. Clang, clang, clang. Nobody knows what could possibly make that sound or why it would make it, but some people suspect that it's the ghosts of the people who died when they were moving between the buildings that are still stuck in those tunnels. And Steve, the stories go on. I mean, there are so many great stories from ghost stories from around North Omaha. The chapel at the Forest Lawn Cemetery has actually been investigated by different uh, groups who have gone out to look for ghosts there. But, you know, one of the most popular ghost stories of all of North Omaha comes from Hommel Park. It's not really a ghost story so much as it's a whole bunch of different stories that people have wound together to make this wonderful, fantastic tale. They talk about the old albino farm that was at Hummel Park and how the albinos roam freely through the park today. They'll talk about how they find scary altars and sites where the goats were sacrificed and all kinds of spookiness. Had me so spooked that when I was a kid, Grandma Sassy took us up into the park when she was visiting once. Man, I looked out my windows the whole time. I have it burnt into my memory watching those trees go by and waiting for the sounds of the guy's feet as he dangled from the tree, scraping on the roof of the car as it went by. I never heard it. I never heard it, and eventually I came to not believe it. Then I researched it, Steve. I looked it up. I looked through the police files. I looked online and through the newspapers. I looked through 200 years of newspapers, through four different newspapers. I looked in all sorts of different sources. And there's no corroboration for the albino farm at North Omaha. There's no real facts that surround that story. But what there is are, are actual newspaper accounts of more than a dozen people being murdered at Hummel Park over the last uh, 80 years, 90 years that it's existed. So there is scariness at Hummel Park. There's scariness in all the parks in Omaha. Hummel just happens to be a little bit more secluded and far out and kind of holds those stories. You can find other stories about the Workers' Progress Administration's stairs and picnic shelters. You can find stories about Devil's Slide and falling and never coming back and all kinds of shenanigans. But I think that this truth can be scarier than the fiction, and especially at Humble Park. And, you know, the other story that I want to make sure to mention, Steve, and it's the one that kind of excites me, to be honest with you. We know about Prospect Hill Cemetery. It's the oldest cemetery in all of Omaha. It pipes up a lot of the news and noise. Well, I know now that it's not the oldest cemetery. What it is, is the oldest recognized cemetery. You see, if you look on maps, and what I have here on, on my website at NorthOmahaHistory.com is a map from the 1870s that shows that Jesse Lowe laid his own cemetery. 
called Cedar Hill Cemetery. And then there was another cemetery just to the north of that called the City Cemetery that connected it with the Prospect Hill Cemetery. Three different cemeteries within this little range. But only one of them is accounted for today. That's because Jesse Lowe sold his cemetery to Byron Reed, who started the Prospect Hill Cemetery. And supposedly, Byron Reed moved the graves up to his cemetery and moved these actual cas caskets and everything. But what we know, Steve, is that the caskets weren't that great. They weren't that good at being moved back in the olden days. You know what happened at the site of the city cemetery and the Cedar Hill Cemetery? Oh, which, by the way, the Cedar Hill Cemetery was four times the size of Prospect Hill. The city cemetery was the same size. You know what happened to those, those cemeteries? They were bulldozed and built on top of. So today, all the area taken by those cemeteries is packed with houses and streets, lawns and trees. And underneath them, who knows? There might be one or two ghosts that are still roaming around looking for their original deathbed that got built on top of. Oh, and by the way, the St. Joe's Hospital, the Creighton Hospital that was just closed and is now being renovated into apartments and this fantastic space where people are going to live, especially the Creighton students, they'll be excited to know that their hospital was built on top of Cedar Hill Cemetery in the olden days. So who knows, there could be ghosts rambling around there too. We got time for one more, Steve? Sure. Well then, let's get into the history of digging up the dead in North Omaha. You see, it turns out that in 1909, the Prospect Hill Cemetery Association, they were trying to uh, make a little bit more room so they could keep making money off of burying people in their cemetery. All of the land had been surrounded, and uh, there, was, there were graves all over the place. Thousands of people were buried in Prospect Hill Cemetery, but they needed some more room. So they gave permission to the grave digger at the cemetery to dig up some old graves. That sounds crazy today, and it was actually crazy back then, because it turns out that grave, those, those missing graves were illegal to have. So the superintendent of the cemetery basically goes like this. The superintendent of the cemetery, his name was Dan Callahan. And Dan Callahan, he went ahead and had his grave diggers go out there and dig up a couple dozen different graves of the old, old, old people and bury new caskets on top of them. Imagine the ghosts roaming around the cemetery when their casket was covered by another casket. They would have been livid. So in 1906, that was all happening. But in 1909, he got busted. And the county came down on him and took him to court. Callahan himself, Superintendent Callahan, he faced $2,500 fine or three years in the state penitentiary. When the verdict came down, he got away with it and was released on bond. But they, and the, the charges were dismissed. But Callahan knew that he could never get away with grave digging ever again. Now, the important part about this story is that we know that in the 1970s, the Prospect Hill Cemetery was in terrible shape. It was getting torn up. And uh, in 79, that's right when uh, the historical preservation has really kicked in and the board for the Prospect Hill Cemetery really kicked in. And everybody started to work to preserve and protect the cemetery, the Prospect Hill Cemetery. And they got it on the National Register, Register of Historic Places. Well, they did this because they were so determined to keep maintaining it, even though they couldn't bury another person there. In 1980, a group of folks in Omaha got together and formed the Prospect Hill Preservation Brass Band. And every year since, on the uh, anniversary of the death of Anna Wilson, the notorious Omaha Madame, uh, they get together and they play. The Prospect Hill Preservation Brass Band plays at an old-fashioned Memorial Day observance. It's super exciting and super big, but that probably wouldn't have happened if the grave digging hadn't have happened at the Prospect Hill Cemetery in 1909, and those ghosts might be satisfied by the sound of the trumpets playing every year on Memorial Day. And that's some of the historic ghost stories from North Omaha, Steve. Thanks for listening to the North Omaha History Podcast with noted author and historian Adam Fletcher Sassy. Join us next week as Adam takes you on another guided tour through Omaha's dynamic past.